Welcome to The Rally Point with Dominic Fielder, the uh, author of the King's German series, and myself, Rob McLaren, the author of the Jobert series. Uh, at The Rally Point, we catch up with friends who enjoy the Napoleonic period, and we are recording this 30-minute interview, but once the recording is over, we remain online uh, as the conversation continues. Uh, this month, we'd like to welcome Dr. Martin Boycott-Brown, uh, to the rally point. Um, uh, Martin is based in Cambridge, England. He's the author of The Road to Rivoli, uh, Napoleon's First Campaign. Welcome, Martin. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Nice uh, to be here. Indeed. indeed. Uh, Martin, we're going to uh, uh, go straight into a, a presentation that you had given to the Jobert audience about uh, Bonaparte's uh, very first battles. Um... Uh, what I tried to do, um, I said the first time around, was to <clears throat> add a little bit of background to the, the Jobert stories. Um, I mentioned that we can all read books and, and maps. Uh, not all of us can walk the terrain. Uh, I was lucky enough to be able to to walk the the terrain because I I lived in Italy for for ten years and some of the battle sites uh, of Napoleon's first campaign were close to to where I lived. Others I had to travel to. Um, so yeah, this is just me rambling, uh, both literally and figuratively, um, over Napoleon's uh, first campaign. So. I just uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the value of walking the actual terrain, a um, little bit about maps and other sources, um, an overview of Liguria, which is the, the region of Italy where the very first battles of uh, Napoleon's first campaign took place. I'm um, looking at Monte Negino, Monte Notte, Monte Notte, so famous, of course. Uh, uh, Technically, uh, theoretically, Napoleon's first battle as a commander. Coseria, um, Dego, uh, Ceva, uh, and uh, just a very quick wrap up. So, uh, the importance of walking in the terrain. Um, this was driven home to me, particularly uh, when I opened up a book by a certain author who shall remain nameless. Um, and uh, looked uh, at the part which I knew something about, which was um, uh, Rivoli and that area. And uh, this particular author described the end of, of the Battle of, of Rivoli with uh, Joachim Murat uh, of legend, fame, uh, leading a, a cavalry charge in into the flank of the retreating Austrians. Um, this fascinated me because uh, Mira, uh, according to this version, landed uh, with um, his light cavalry on the edge of Lake Garda at a place called Malcesine. Well, Mal <laughs> Right, this is Lake Garda, uh, this is uh, where the arrow points, that's Malchese, you know, where um, theoretically uh, Joachim Murat landed uh, with his, uh, his light cavalry, and apparently the, the charge went up this slope, <laughs> uh, and if you are standing on the field of Rivoli, this is the, the mountain top that uh, apparently the charge went over. And we assume that the charge must have gone down this hill because the, the Austrians were retreating in that direction. Um, it's my firm belief that if the author had seen the terrain, he wouldn't have written what he did. Um, but who knows? <laughs> anyway, um, that's a little bit of an aside. Um, 
I just wanted to show people this because this is uh, a copy of the only map that was available to Napoleon Bonaparte of this particular area of, of Italy. Uh, we know that he had a copy of this map with him. Um, and you can see it's not a, a particularly good map. I mean, it, it's not bad, but I mean, it dates from the end of the 17th century and um, yeah. Uh, it's it's not like an ordnance survey map with uh, with nice contours and so on and, and so forth. So, uh, given that Napoleon Bonaparte's uh, method of warfare was very much about movement, uh, um, and this is the only map that he had, it's it's remarkable really that uh, he managed to do what uh, he did. But that's just a little bit of an aside. Um, that's a modern map of, of the area. Um, one observation I made was that um, uh, the road network, the modern road wet network is not the same as the old uh, 18th century network. Um, so even if you do walk the train, you do have to be careful about uh, making assumptions about how easy it might be to get to a particular place because for us now, it's, it's, it's different. Um, Something else I pointed out was that um, in this particular area of Italy, um, not infrequently, quite major routes passed along ridge lines rather than in valleys, which uh, is not what you might expect. And the reason for that was partly that valleys were subject to flood. Um, uh, if snow fell in, in the valleys, uh, probably melt later actually than it would on the ridge lines because uh, they were in shadow. Um, so ridge lines were very much used um, at that period. So um, I just made some reference here to some uh, works that Napoleon consulted. I mean, he knew a lot about this particular area of Italy even though he, he hadn't personally traveled it much him, himself. Because of books like this, the Histoire des Campagnes uh, du Marchal de Mayabois, um, Mayabois campaigned in this particular area of, of, of Italy. Um, and this history of his campaigns has in the back of it a kind of gazetteer, which um, you can see on the side of the screen there, I hope. Uh, it's full of, of, of information, just little descriptions of uh, villages, towns, and so on and so forth, um, fortresses. So Napoleon had a lot of information about places he hadn't been to and hadn't seen, um, which must have been a great assistance to him in his campaigning. Uh, Cheva is, is mentioned there, that arrow points to the entry uh, about Cheva. Um, it tells you sort of, um, you know, how roughly how big the castle was, you know, where it stood, how many men it could hold and so on and so forth. Lots of entries uh, have that kind of detail in them. So um, I also mentioned this. Um, which gives a lot of information uh, about um, Montenotte, the area of Montenotte. But this was um, this was collected post uh, post the campaigns. Uh, one uh, one source of information for us as historians is uh, the works by Fabry, um, which contain reports which were made on uh, Napoleon's in initiative. Um, uh, in the period roughly sort of 1802, 1803 and thereabouts when Napoleon was sort of, I, I'm sure, thinking of building his legend. And uh, quite detailed surveys were made of certain of the battlefields. Let's try and move on rapidly. Uh, just to, uh, to give you a, a view of Liguria, the area, um, the Gulf of Genoa, um, Savona, Altare, 
right in the middle of the map is is the sort of main area of of activity. Passing right, that's Chaver. Uh, incidentally, that was that was Napoleon's sort of initial objective was to to reach Chaver um, and and capture that. Uh, then he would pass to Mondovi, and then he would go uh, north um, to Carrasco um, and threaten Turin. So this is what the terrain looks like uh, just inland from uh, from the coast, the Gurian coast. You can see it's a very rugged coast, very broken up. Um, yeah, very difficult terrain to to move through. Uh, it's um, yeah, well, you can see they're not high mountains, but um, but they're still obstacles to um, to movement without any doubt. This is uh, near Finale. This is just inland from Finale. Uh, this is the Gulf of Genoa. This is looking from Savona across. Uh, to towards Genoa, the um, pale buildings that actually is Genoa. Um, the modern coast road makes it quite quick to to travel from uh, Savona to to Genoa, but uh, in in Napoleon's time it wasn't like that at all. It was kind of uphill, down dale, um, not an easy journey. Uh, which is why ships and boats were used for communication up and down the coast. Uh, it was much quicker to go by ship or boat than it would have been to travel over land. So um, this is the map. I won't dwell on the map uh, because we haven't really got time. Um, that's Monte Nigino, which is... Uh, the famous defensive point where the, the first actions, um, the first important actions took place. Um, that's Montenotte Superiore, the famous Montenotte, uh, the Battle of Montenotte. Cascina <clears throat> uh, Garbazzo, that little place there, is where the Austrian um, troops assembled before they uh, moved south in the direction of... Um, Savona. Um, down at the bottom there is uh, the place where Napoleon actually stood to, to watch the, the Battle of Montenotte. As you can see, he was miles away. Uh, he wasn't, he wasn't hands-on in this particular battle. Uh, yeah, that's, it's, um, sorry, that's Kabyanka is, uh, the blue arrow is showing, that's that was Napoleon's standpoint. Um, you can see um, this area is 2,100 feet um, high. That's the, the pass. So we're not talking about high mountains here. This is what the terrain looks like um, around about uh, Montenotte. I mean, it, it's woodland, uh, uh, dense woodland. Uh, Liguria is one of the most forested areas of, of Italy, if not the most forested areas. Um, so, you know, this is cowboys and Indians country, really. This is not uh, the kind of area where you can have very large formations moving around in, in classic 18th century style. This is... Um, this is a different proposition. Uh, these are young trees, as you can see. Um, the trees in this area would have been coppiced. They would have been farmed, basically. So uh, they would have been cut down periodically and uh, allowed to regrow. It's an interesting point that uh, the staple product in this particular area, the, the main food that people ate was chestnuts. Um, vast quantities of chestnuts were produced in, in this area. This is Cascina Garbazzo. This is where the Austrian uh, troops assembled before they attacked Monte Nigino. Um, this is one of the few open areas in, in this particular, um, uh, in, in this whole 
whole area. Um, so you can see why the Austrians chose to assemble here. I mean, you've got 5,000 troops, you know, you, you can't assemble anybody in, in the middle of a forest, um, but you can in, uh, in open terrain like this. You can see there is snow on the ground. Uh, this was taken in April. Um, so that gives you an idea of what the weather is like. Also notice it's quite hazy. Um, uh, this is uh, a, a, a drawing, a painting of Montenegino, uh, the redoubt on uh, on the peak closest to us, a, a secondary redoubt uh, further behind it. Um, you can see the smoke with the Austrians um, climbing up the ridge towards the, the redoubt. Uh, this is an aerial view. It's a drone shot of the redoubt. Um, you can see the, this path leading up to, to the peak, and you can see the road lower down. That's the, the road which goes from the direction of Montenotte towards Savona. Savona is right on the coast, and you can just about see it in the, in the distance there. So this is an example of a, of a road, a, a road that follows the ridge line rather than following um, the valley. Um, and you can, once again, you can see how wooded it is. I mean, it's absolutely covered with trees. And the, the problem for the Austrians was that they had to advance up that small path, basically, to the top of the hill uh, and attack this redoubt, stone built redoubt. Um, on that peak, uh, roughly in the centre there. And the sides of the slope are very steep. Uh, it may not appear like that in this photograph, but uh, they are pretty steep. That arrow shows where the redoubt was. Uh, and that's Savona in the background there. And that line shows, arrow shows the, the line of advance. This is looking from the redoubt in the opposite direction. Um, you get an idea of how steep the, the slope is from uh, that man walking up it, and you can see uh, the cars parked down there on the road. You can also see the fog. Fogs come up very, very quickly in this particular area of the country, and um, Things can be shrouded in fog in, in seconds, really. Um, so that's a nice illustration of that. Um, the fog clears. You can see this is, you know, within minutes of, of taking the, the previous um, photograph. And you, you can see the roads in the distance snake, snaking back. That goes to towards Montenotte. And you get a better idea of how steep the slopes are from uh, from this angle. Um, that is the that was the line of attack of of the Austrian troops. Good luck to them. <clears throat> and this is the redoubt it, itself. Uh, this is taken on from one edge of the redoubt and the, the man crouching down is, is on the other edge of the redoubt. So you can see it's not a big, big object at all. I mean, it, it's how on earth they got, I don't know what it was, um, a battalion of a demi-brigade, how on earth they fitted them in, I, I really don't know. They, they were no doubt under strength, but um, even so, it, it's not a big space. Um, uh, and this is uh, Napoleon and his staff watching the um, the Battle of Montenotte unfold. Um, and of course, it's unfolding on the ridge line about six miles away. Um, Napoleon and his staff, uh, after watching for a while, um, mounted on horseback and, and tried to actually ride to Montenotte so to be a bit closer to the action. But... Um, they took a took the wrong road. Um, uh, they they stopped a monk who who told them, "No, you're you're on the wrong road." <laughs> so um, Napoleon actually never got to Montenotte on, on on the day of the battle. 
Uh, this is a photograph um, taken from roughly from that position where he was standing. And you can see the ridge line. That's the, the ridge line on which the, the Battle of Montenotte took place. So he was quite definitely a spectator um, in this particular instance. <clears throat> Uh, that's uh, that's where the redoubt was. Um, yep, no no close command and control in this particular instance. Mm -hmm. uh, this is looking back uh, from um, from the road leading up to 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 Montenotte, looking uh, at the countryside, um, looking down to walk towards the coast. Basically, once again, you can see how rugged it is. How covered in in wood and and scrub. Um, you you move along roads there if you've got an army. You don't move over the country because, well, you can do if you want to, but it, it's um, very very slow going. Crosseria. Um, this is a, a model of, of castle of Crosseria. Um, the uh, I think I put some arrows in. Uh, that's the the gateway to um, the castle of Corsaria. It was very ruined, incidentally, uh, at the time of uh, of the actions here. Um, Joubert um, was not Joubert, but Joubert was the um, main attacker, uh, and that shows the line of his advance to towards um, the castle. That's that's where he attacked. How are we doing for time, Rob? Absolutely brilliant, mate. Uh, no, you keep going. Um, Good. We're, you know, we're, we're doing very well. This is this is excellent stuff. Thank you. Um, that's just a, a a map showing of the the terrain, uh, which we won't dwell on. Um, closer. Yeah, this this is one of the vantage points. Uh, you know, Napoleon had these wanted to have these paintings made of of um, uh, the battlefields, and that's one of the reasons why the survey of the of Corsaria was done. And this angle here shows you um, one of the positions that was laid down for the artist, an Italian artist, to to make his um, his painting of of the attack on on Corsaria. Uh, this is another one of them, um, and this is the the picture that resulted from from the instructions that uh, the artist was given. It was it was called Bajetti. Uh, you might think that that is a, a kind of exaggerated um, height of of the castle, but. Um, Actually, it's not. Uh, this is the photograph. Um, the castle is right on the top of that um, that peak there. So you can see that Joubert, just as the Austrians had an interesting time attacking Montenegino, uh, Joubert was given an un interesting time attacking Corsaria. Um, There's not an easy proposition at all. Um, that is one of the paths that uh, leads up to uh, the gate. Um, you can see how steep that is and how steep the slopes are. I mean, this was this was a properly kind of constructed defensive position. Um, this was a, a reenactment that I uh, attended. Um, and you can see uh, the people are right up at the top are actually sitting on what's left of the ramparts. Um, they weren't very high in uh, 1796 and probably a bit lower um, in in modern times. Um, this is the, the direction of Joubert's attack up, up this slope. Uh, we move on to Daigo. Um, this is Bajetti's uh, picture of, of Daigo, uh, one of the ones that Napoleon wanted made. Uh, you can see the troops there 
preparing to cross the the river um, and uh, attack the um, Austrian and Piedmontese positions on uh, on the far side of of the river. You can see the the castle of uh, of Daigo um, up uh, on the hill there. Uh, this is a modern photograph, my photograph of uh, of the of the castle at uh, at Daigo. Um, I think you can see why you wouldn't bother to try and attack that. Um, <clears throat> well, actually, the French did come down this side of, of the river. Um, they did send some troops uh, along the, the hills uh, on this side, but that wasn't the main attack. Uh, the main attack was uh, made by um, Laap on, on the other side of the river to, to the left of us here. Um, once again, the castle, another uh, illustration of why you wouldn't try and attack it directly. <laughs> uh, we're standing here on uh, on the fields. Uh, if you think back to the painting I, I just showed you, this is the area where the, uh, the French troops uh, would have moved across. Uh, you can see a little hut that's standing on, on the banks of the river, basically. So... Uh, the French troops would have moved towards the left here and um, crossed the river uh, round about here, roughly. Uh, they would have crossed the river. The uh, redoubts are on, on the far side of the river on on those lower hills that you can see on, on the far side of the river. This is taken from... A, beyond the castle on, on the high ground, looking down uh, towards the, uh, the low ground, um, the, the redoubts would have been off to, off to the right there, curving around. Very difficult to give an idea of what the, the terrain is, is like from a, a simple photograph like this. Um, but one thing to I, I think is worth commenting on, which is um, how much more open the terrain is. Uh, we're away from the forests now. Uh, we've now got open fields where you can actually maneuver troops in conventional 18th century formations. <clears throat> so the uh, the type of combat changes i suppose quite noticeably um at this at this point more on that later perhaps oh yeah that that arrow points to towards the uh, position of of the redoubts this is looking in the other direction uh, you um with the castle behind us now looking roughly uh, north uh, northeast you will remember famously um uh, the french troops dispersed at, at dago they they went on a rampage and sort of went around pillaging and getting drunk and then uh, some austrian troops appeared out of nowhere apparently um in the morning and recaptured Dago, so Dago had to be recaptured again by Massena and his um, and his merry men. Um, one comment I made uh, last time we, we saw this was that I think one of the reasons why the French troops dispersed was because there were all these farmhouses uh, and settlements dotted around the place. You're standing on a hill, you look around and you think, oh, well, you know, there's somewhere I can go and find uh, something to eat or something to drink. And of course, you know, each each little group of soldiers picks a, a different farmhouse. Um, they, you're not going to disperse in a forest because you can't see anything. And there's you, you can't have an idea of where there might be a place to go and uh, get something to, to drink or, or to eat. Standing on a hill like this, looking around you, you can see targets, basically. So I think it wasn't just indiscipline or, or drunkenness or anything else that made the, the French troops spread out. I think it was also the terrain and the opportunity was provided by that. 
just a personal theory of mine. Um, Cheva, um, yeah, this uh, this map shows um, the way that um, the French army uh, went from Milesimo to Montezemolo to to Cheva. Um, just um, an overview of of the advance. Um, yeah, and that blue line shows you the uh, line of defences that the Piedmontese had constructed um, above Cheva. It wasn't just the fortress of Cheva that was important. It was the entrenched camp. Um, I took some photographs from La Peda Um Okay, yeah. This is a, um, a, a modern map showing um, the all of the redoubts, uh, the Piedmontese redoubts in, in a line and giving you um, the uh, movements of, of the, the French troops. Uh, it was mostly Augereau's um, division that was involved in, in the fighting here. Uh, this is um, Bagetti's uh, picture of, of the entrenched camp so you can see this was not an improvised affair at all this was a, a this was a serious piece of 18th century fortification uh, and of course the the French attack on this fortification failed which is something which is um, not widely um, publicized by uh, francophiles shall we say <laughs> um, this is a photograph uh, giving you an idea of the terrain. You can see the, the Maritime Alps uh, in the background there. Um, once again, it's it's open terrain, it's fields, there, there aren't so many trees, um, but it is still pretty hilly as, as you can see. The uh, redoubts would have been on that line of hills that you can see in, in the middle distance there. Uh, we're looking roughly in the direction of, uh, of Cheva itself. Cheva is sort of down the slope, if you like, down the hill. Uh, the French attack would have moved from the, the hills on the left uh, across the valley and uh, up the, the, the hills on, on the right. And that's it. That uh, apologies for the rather mad gallop, but um, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> Questions. <clears throat> well, Martin, thank you for that. That that was very very good. The uh, we are so lucky to have your your insight. Uh, not only uh, glimpsing uh, original first sources of research that you showed us in the beginning, but the impact of, of ground not just battle. Um, the offensive, the defensive of both sides, um, plus the, the those post battle uh, anomalies of, um, um, of you know, you know Athena losing his troops after the first battle of Dagon. Tom, oh, over to you. What what, what are your 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 well I, after I, just I'm going to say to echo uh, Rob's point about thank you very much for that. Um, it's a campaign I know very little about, but having looked at that terrain. Uh, I'm struck by a couple of things. First, with the idea of the, the roads on the ridge lines, and just the the density of the terrain, and it made me think it's it's nothing like the Napoleonic battles that we sort of envision of mm. commanders even you know have detached but able to see the battlefield. Here is somebody who's able to control the the movement of his army, whatever, whatever the size of it, over terrain where he's losing sight of it really quickly, and it struck me with. With my interest being, say, the the, um, the wars of the first coalition, where the French army be becomes, and one of the generals says about the fact he's uh, he's critical of the army that it's become almost a skirmisher based army. Hmm. The troops that Napoleon takes to Rivoli are these ones that have sort of earned their their corn already, and and are they therefore sort of better suited to fighting than the Austrians? in this sort of terrain in your opinion or is that is that what you're seeing do, do we know the, the provenance of the troops he's taking 
Yes, <clears throat> we do. Um, I most of well, a lot of the troops uh, that Napoleon had um, during the seventeen ninety six campaign had fought mostly in northern Italy. Uh, they'd fought along uh, the Riviera uh, and through Italy. Some of them had also fought in the Pyrenees. Um, this is a, a, a much neglected uh, part of the um, uh, wars of the revolution, uh, 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 other campaigns that took place in, in the Pyrenees. Um, Ogelo, for example, uh, was uh, one of the commanders who, who um, spent some time in, in the Pyrenees. So he would have learned about sort of mountain fighting uh, in, in that particular area. Um, so, yeah, yeah, there are some interesting comments about um, about the difference between the Austrian troops and the French troops. There is a source that I found, um, which was written by um, an Austrian officer in 1796-97. I think it was published in 1797, which you know seems incredible, really, but uh, it was published you know, right uh, right at the time. Uh, this officer had been uh, captured by the French and he uh, observed the, the French troops uh, being drilled, being prepared. And he said that uh, the manoeuvres went off well enough um, without you know much fuss basically and he commented that you know austrian troops would have been would have needed to be sort of beaten black and blue for you know for a couple of years before they would could have arrived at, at the the standard of, of, of the french troops and he seemed to be implying that the the french were motivated which made them quick to learn. And something that supports that is there is the memoir of uh, or Orgay, who was, um, he was just a lieutenant, I think, uh, at that particular time. He was in the 32nd uh, Demi Brigade. I mean, he went on to become a general as, as various of them did. And in his memoir, he um, speaks of uh, being given the job of training uh, his troops and the rank and file in the ordinary maneuvers that we would associate with, with linear tactics. And in his memoir, he said he, he, he got hold of the drill book and uh, pretended to be ill for three days and sat in his tent and read the drill book <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so that he wouldn't be disturbed. And then uh, he came out uh, and began teaching his, his troops um, how to fight in, uh, in linear fashion, um, which is extraordinary, really. Uh, uh, I mean, and this is in the middle of the campaign. I mean, this is not before the campaign. This is during the campaign. He's actually uh, teaching the troops because the French were also aware that they were going from a, a mountainous forested area into the plains of northern Italy, it's all flat, you know, you can maneuver there, you have to maneuver. So they, they were aware that they were going to have to change their tactics. They were aware that they were going to have to teach the troops how to maneuver in, in this fashion. Uh, there is another memoir by um, um, a grenadier who became a lieutenant colonel uh, in later life, uh, Vigo Roussillon. Uh, he was wounded uh, 
it, just before the, the battles of Lonato and Castiglione. And he said that, you know, when he got back to his unit, in, in his words, he, he said, I found them very proud of having maneuvered at the Battle of Castiglione. So this was a novelty for them. It was a first that they were actually going to maneuver in classic 18th century fashion. So, yeah, it's a very interesting period in the development of the French army, uh, apart from anything else. So thank you, everyone, for a fascinating conversation so far. I'm about to end our recording, but please stay online as we chat. Uh, to wrap up this month's Rally Point, thank you, Dr. Martin Boycott Brown, for joining us. Coming up next month, uh, we chat with Victor Eisen, uh, an internationally renowned Napoleon, Napoleonic reenactor. I hope you can uh, join us for the chat. In fact, next time, why not? Why not join us here at the Rally Point? Simply con uh, contact Dominic and I uh, on our emails, our Facebook Messenger, or Twitter for your Zoom invite. Uh, and we want to, we do want to hear from you, any games, books, or events that are occurring in your area. Um, and please share Rally Point with your friends. Um, previous Rally Points will be up on our YouTube channel. So uh, it's good morning from me, and it's good night from him. Good night.